Okay, so I think we will probably get started, but uh, I wanted to really quickly explain the, the chest timer rules. So, despite what this chest timer here says, really the speaker has 20 minutes and the audience has 20 minutes. The chest timer is stupid and says 25, so five minutes is zero, just remember that. But So 20 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, and the rule is in the first five minutes, the audience cannot interrupt the, uh, the presenter because you, know, you need a little bit of time to explain what he's talking about. Uh, but that after that, you know, basically, it's your job to help him get to the full 40 minutes of the, of the talk slot. So please interrupt him. I mean, if there's anything slightly unclear, it's your opportunity to jump up and be like, nope, I don't get it. Please, can you try again? Uh, and then he can you know, go through it again. Or you know, if there's some interesting thing that he didn't mention, maybe he did this deliberately so that you asked. But this is supposed to be interactive. So uh, if you're sitting there just like sleeping, you're not doing it right. You gotta kind of jump up and try to, try to, try to get something going, some conversation going. So uh, at this point, I will, I will cede to Frank. Cool. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Frank and I'm a PhD student at MIT CSAIL. So thanks for having me today at Curion. So I'm gonna present on my research um, a system called CIV and it provides uh, cryptographically enforced access control for user data in untrusted clouds. Uh, this talk is based on a paper that was published in this year's NSDI conference. So I'm gonna provide an overview of the work and some a little bit of technical details. Of course, I won't be able to go through everything. And you can find more details on the paper on my website, which is uh, frankwang.org. So to motivate CIV, so let's consider the following scenario. So a user has a Fitbit that collects data on her fitness, like her heart rate, number of steps, miles run, etc. And this data is now stored on the Fitbit server, which acts as the user's storage provider. Now she wants to share different subsets of this data with various services. So for example, she might want to send only her running time for the New York Marathon to the New York Marathon service to participate in the leaderboard, or she might want to send her running times for other marathons to the Boston Marathon for qualification purposes, and she might want to send parts of her fitness data every month to her insurance company to receive a discount, and the list can go on. However, there's a major security issue in that model. A curious storage provider who is logged in, or an external attacker like a hacker, can leak sensitive user data from the server. Well, one naive approach is that users can always encrypt the data before storing it in the storage provider. However, in order to give the New York Marathon access to her data, she now has to give the New York Marathon her key. This is problematic because now the New York Marathon can access all her data because it has the key for all the data. So this approach allows the user to securely store her data, but the question is how does the user selectively disclose her data? Well, the user can always, another approach is that to encrypt each piece of data individually and distribute subsets of these keys. However, a Fitbit is constantly generating new data and all that data needs to be encrypted with different keys. So now the user is stuck managing all these keys. So the question is, can we build a system um, that does this better? This leads to our research system, which is CIV. It's a new platform that allows users to both selectively and securely disclose their data. Some of the features of CIV is that it protects against server compromise. It hides key management from users, has reasonable performance. We support revocation, and it's particularly useful for services that analyze large amounts of user data. So here's an outline for the rest of the talk. Um, I'll talk about different components of CIV, the protocol, some optimizations we make, um, revocation. Then I'll go on to talk about the implementation and evaluation. So here I'll present an overview of the system, not with all the kind of crypto elements involved yet, but just to kind of give you a sense of what the system looks like overall and what components are involved. So CIV has three main principles. There's the user the storage provider, which stores the user data, and web services, which analyze the user data. There are three main components in CIV. There's the CIV user client, the CIV storage daemon, and the CIV data import module. So to relate this back to the original example, 
the storage provider would just be the Fitbit cloud server and the web services are the Boston Marathon service, New York Marathon insurance companies, et cetera, et cetera. So first the user using the Civ user client tags and encrypts her data with attributes that represent access for future web services and sends this data to the storage provider. So this data can either be generated by the user directly or by a device like a wearable. And when the user first visits a web service, she generates a decryption key that corresponds to a policy on the types of data the service can access and gives this key to the web service. So later in this talk, we'll show how we can revoke the web services access. So now the web service has the ability to download and decrypt user data. So the user send the web service sends a user data request to allow, download the encrypted data. And since the web service has the decryption key and the data, it can now decrypt the data using the Civ data import module. So the web service now stores this data in its own servers and storage, and it can use it for different types of analysis. One thing to know is that all these interactions can be asynchronous. In fact, the user doesn't even have to be online after she gives the web service the key for it to access the data. Yes. Can you go back and explain to me which key? I'm confused about what key you're encrypting with. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll actually get to it later in the talk, but I'll, um, but you usually, uh, so, so the system we end up using is a public key system. So you encrypt with a public key and then you give a private key, which is a decryption key to the web service. So the restriction happens when I encrypt the data. Sorry. Yeah, you're cryptically the, the the key you give prevent only allows you to decrypt a certain subset of the data. It has a special each web service has a special private key that only allows it to decrypt certain parts of the data. You you can't prevent the web services from sharing the secret keys. Repeat the question. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, so the question was, how do you prevent um, the web service from uh, sharing the keys? Um, or you, uh, we assume, we trust the web service to um, to hold the keys um, that uh, and kind of we trust it to to not give it to other web services. Or if it does, you know, those web services can't access data that you know the user has given no one access to. Uh, yeah, so to summarize the question, uh, so uh, you have uh, you have three pieces of data and there's one commonly shared piece of data between two web services. Um, do I have to encrypt the data twice? You, uh, so we're going to use a special cryptographic scheme that makes it so that you only have to encrypt the data once. And then I'll talk about that in a couple of slides. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so Yeah, so the question is uh, is the user the end user or is it a theoretical client? Uh, um so we assume that if you were to use the system in practice, the user itself would um use this client or download this client that allows them to share the keys and actually do it um in in reality. Like in practice, the users would create the key and share it. But of course, this is all abstracted away from the user. Cool. Uh, so now I've given you an overview of Civ. We'll talk specifically more about the security problems and the threat model. Um, so we assume that the storage provider is a passive adversary, which means the adversary can read all the data um, on the network, but still follows the protocol. Uh, we assume that web services are trusted with user data once they're given access to it. 
and we trust the users and her devices. So this kind of answers some of the questions people are asking. Um, so how do we do this? So our approach is to use this cryptographic primitive called attribute-based encryption. Um, we assume that there's a user-specific attribute uh, AB public and private key pair. And there are three main functions um, for AB. There's the generate decryption key function, um, encrypt and decrypt. So first, uh, generate decryption key takes in a policy and an AB private key and it outputs an AB decryption key. And so a policy is a predicate connected by ands and ors, for example, um, year is less than 2013, and type equals fitness. Yes. So the question was, can you just um, consider the policy as a, as a definition of a set? Y yes, that's, that's one way to think about it. Um, so to, to kind of add on to the question of why we think about policies and tags is because users already kind of tag their data. For example, I tag photos and stuff. And so I guess users will probably think of them as kind of just specific attributes rather than kind of a set definition. But if you're kind of a more security and privacy savvy person, you can th think of it as a set. So if you have these situations where you want to commonly encrypt like one thing, B. Um, yes. You can use negation um, and, and, and it handles both integers and strings. Equality, Equality and less than. Yeah. Cool. Um, so uh, the second function is encrypt, which takes in um, attributes, uh, clear text, um, or takes in attributes, clear text data, and the AB public key, and it outputs a ciphertext. So examples of attributes are key value pairs, like location equals US, um, year equals 2012, and type equals fitness. And finally, there's the decrypt function, um, which takes in a ciphertext um, and a, a AB um, key policy, and it only decrypts uh, the ciphertext if the ciphertext attributes satisfy the key policy. And one important thing to know is that the attributes and policies are in clear text. So now let's look at Civ with um, AB involved. As you may have noticed, AB fits very well into this architecture. Um, so first, the user uses the AB encrypt function to tag and encrypt her data. Uh, then she sends this data to the storage provider. Um, when she visits a web service, she generates an AB decryption key, and she gives the AB decryption key to the web service. And now the web service can just go to the storage provider, download the encrypted data, and use its key to perform AB decryption uh, to get the clear text data. However, there's still a few challenges with AB, specifically um, performance and revocation. So since AB is a public key crypto system, it's slower than symmetric key cryptography. So we want to reduce the number of AB operations that are being done. Um, in our paper, we're specifically employed two optimizations. In this talk, I'll discuss um, hybrid encryption. I'll refer you to the paper for storage-based data structures, or so just an extension of hybrid encryption that packs more data um, under under one, um, one, one metadata block, which I'll explain later. So in hybrid encryption, first you generate the symmetric key, and that key is used to encrypt the data. And then the AB public key is used to encrypt the symmetric key and the GUID, which represents the location of the actual encrypted data block. And this way, symmetric encryption, the faster encryption method, can be applied to the larger data, and um, ABE is applied to the smaller, small and fixed size data. And encrypting GUIDs are important for storage-based data structures, which we explain more in the paper. And both these um, encrypted objects are uploaded to the cloud, for the rest of the talk, the block that is encrypted with the ABE key, well, um, we'll refer to it as the metadata block. And in the storage provider, the data block is indexed by the GUIDs and the metadata block is um, indexed by the ABE attributes. So for future updates, yes. I don't know what it's Oh, so the question is, what's a GUID? A GUID is just, it's just an ID number. So whenever you load something, for example, to Amazon S3 or Amazon AWS, um, you store something there, it spits back kind of an ID. You can think of it as just a, a hashed ID. 
that uh, that can get you the location of a specific object very quickly. So for future updates that require uploads by the user or downloads by the web service, um, the user and web services can just cache the symmetric key and GUID so it can go and just look it up directly without having to download the metadata block again. And they can use the um, GUID to access directly to just pour, um, perform symmetric key operations only for future, uh, for future gets. So now I'll talk a little bit about revocation. So let's go back to our initial Fitbit example. So suppose a user now wants to switch insurance companies. So she wants to revoke the insurance company's access. However, what if the old insurance company becomes compromised in the future? Remember that the old insurance company has cached keys from hybrid encryption that it can use to access the user's data. Well, that's problematic. So we need a way to re-encrypt the data to provide a cryptographically strong revocation. So how do we do that? So we need to both re-encrypt the metadata block and the data block. Well, it's easy to re-encrypt the metadata block, um, we, which is smaller than the size of the overall data. We can just download the metadata block, decrypt it, and upload it again. And since it's a small amount, it doesn't take that long. Um, so how do we re-encrypt the data object, which is might be much larger? Well, we can always just download that, re-encrypt, and um, upload the data object. But that requires a substantial amount of bandwidth and client-side computation. So the question is, can we do better? Yes. So the question is, how does the um, user know when the insurance company has become malicious? Uh, so, so usually the flow of events is that I want to switch. So, so the point is that I want to switch insurance companies or I don't want to use it anymore. So the user has to initiate the revocation. So the user may or may not know, maybe they don't want them to have access anymore. So the way you should think about it is now, for example, you use Facebook um, OAuth to grant access to a variety of things. And so, for example, you might not know something is malicious, but you might want to revoke their access anyways. Or if you know it becomes malicious, then you want to take away their access right away. Yes. Um, so, so I'm talking about, uh, in a, so the question is, uh, how slow is this encryption method? Um, so the encryption itself is very fast, but the problem is doing the re-encryption. So downloading the data, um, decrypting it, re-encrypting and uploading again is pretty slow because you have to pay this like round trip latency cost. And that can vary based on your network latency, which could be a lot or slow, but we imagine like a user, uh, might just use her, uh, her home internet or another way of thinking about it is like, it could be your mobile phone also. So it could be much lower if you're on something like 3G or 4G. Yes. Uh, so the question is, um, um, how, how does kind of downloading and re-encrypting uh, help with preventing the insurance company from accessing data in the future? And so, oh, so you, the point of kind of downloading and re-encrypting is you do it with a different key. Yeah, so yeah. Cool. So we want to be able to do this without having to pay the bandwidth cost. And so the solution is to use this um, cryptographic primitive called key homomorphism which allows changing the key in encrypted data. Um, what, what I mean is that it, it creates, it gives you a symmetric cipher that provides in-place re-encryption without decrypting the data. And the guarantees that it gives you is that um, you don't learn the old key, new key, or plain text. Yes. When you say in-place, does it mean the process coming from the server? Uh, or do you mean the process so the question is, by in place, do I mean that it happens on the server? It does. So we trust that the server performs the action, but the server doesn't learn anything, um, any information about the data block during the re-encryption process. Yes. Does that mean that you continuously, for all future readings on that data set, have to encrypt twice or something? Or no? Like, how does it, like, does the in place thing work? Do you mean that they have to take the originally encrypted Data, 
<laughs> okay. Uh, Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Once you read her, read her script, you don't no longer need the old key at all, correct? Uh, so the question is, uh, when I re-encrypt, I don't need the old key at all. Yeah, I don't need the old key at all. Yeah. Sure. Maybe the next slide will clarify the whole process. But uh, you feel free to ask a question. <laughs> uh, the question is, so, so the organization that you uh, trust to give you the keys, right? But not to the one that you don't trust. So each, uh, so the question is, does the organizations get new keys? And um, the answer is, so, so it's a little bit more subtle than that. So certain organizations get new keys, and certain organizations, their keys can stay the same. It depends on um, what data you're revoking access to. I think this next slide will help people. Um, but if you're confused after that one, I will, I will be happy to answer questions. So, so here I'll describe the whole revocation process. So in a sieve, simple sieve data object, there's a metadata block with a symmetric key um, and an encrypted data block that's um, encrypted using that symmetric key, which is encrypted using ABE. So one in, important detail to note is that if a user wants to have revocation in their system, she has to do, introduce um, an epic number as an attribute when she generates and tags data. So similarly, she has to include this epic number as part of a policy for the web service keys she gives out. Um, this number just represents the number of revocations that has happened. It could be something more clever, um, but just for now, let's assume that it represents the number of revocations. And the purpose of this epic number is that during revocation, it allows users to re-encrypt just the data with attributes affected by the web services key policy um, that's being revoked, rather than re-encrypt all of their data. So then the user generates what we call re-keying token, which is just a function of the old key and the new key, and sends this token to the storage provider who applies it to the appropriate data block and then deletes the token. Um, this causes the data block to be uh, re-encrypted. Next, um, next, we want to re-encrypt the, uh, the metadata block. So the user just generates a new metadata block based on the new symmetric key that uh, she used to re-encrypt the data block. And um, that's encrypted using AB public key with the same attributes, but with an incremented um, ep epoch. And this now replaces the old metadata block. So the user does this process for all the data blocks that the revoke web service had access to. And finally, the user issues new keys to web services whose data access has changed and been affected by this revocation. Yes. Um, so, uh, so the question is: Does uh, so the this do I deal with? Um, does the um, system deal with uh, with authentication? Um, so we kind of like punt authentication um, to kind of like the user um, knowing that this is the web service they actually want to access. Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah. Well, Oh yeah, so oh, you're talking about the authentication for the data. So yeah, I didn't actually mention this in the talk. So in the data, the data includes a data, the data block, and um, a signed version also in the encrypted data. So there would be a piece of data and then something signed um, with the user's uh, private key. Okay, but in that case, okay. So does the does the re-encryption scheme uh, re-sign that, or does it just sign the Yeah, so the, the, the data, the data right there, like that says data, that includes actually the actual data block and a signed version encrypted. Like they're all, in, so the signatures don't get affected during re encryption because the signature itself is also encrypted. Oh, okay, so it's not, say, encrypted and hacked. It's, it's done all in that. Yeah, so it's in, encrypted, uh, it's, um, it's encrypt, sign, uh, it's, sorry, it's, uh, it's signed and encrypt. Yeah, which is which is fine because it's uh, it's different from a Mac. Cool. Um, now I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the implementation and evaluation. Um, so for the Civ implementation, we use uh, for cryptography this ABE library called libfank, um, which uses the Stanford pairing-based cryptography library, 
and we implement it with two different symmetric ciphers, um, AES, which has no revocation, and randomized counter mode with um, ED448, which has revocation. And so the CIV user client um, has about 1,400 lines of code. Um, the CIV storage daemon has about 1,000 lines of code, and we use MongoDB and Berkeley DB in the background. And the CIV data import module really depends on the web service you use, which leads to our evaluation, which, is, um, which looks at two major questions. Um, is it easy to integrate CIV into existing web services? And can web services achieve reasonable performance while using CIV? And for the evaluation setup, we use a multi-core machine with 2.4 gigahertz Intel Xeon processors. And the web services we ran on machine loopback. So numbers you see will have uh, almost no network latency so we can see what the cryptographic overheads are. And we have two major case studies that we integrated with. One is um, this piece of software called OpenM Health, which represents small data and um, helps you visualize health data. And a week's worth of health data is about six kilobytes. And we have um, another photo service called Puiga, which has much larger data. And the service allows you to edit and display photos. And one photo is about 375 kilobytes. And so we show that it's pretty easy to integrate with Civ. So the lines of code required for integration, it's about 200 lines for OpenM Health, about 250 lines for Puigo. And so here are just some results for OpenM Health and Puigo using um, ED448 with key caching. Um, we have acceptable performance for both case studies. We see that reading and writing a week's worth of OpenM Health data takes less than a second. And the read and write time for Puigo is longer because the data is larger. And so there's a performance gap between AES and ED448. Yes. Just one photo is 300 sometimes, but So the question is, how many photos are there in um, this benchmark? There's only one photo. Okay. Um, cool. So, so here we just show there's a performance gap. Um, however, this is because ED448 is a less optimized than AES, which has hardware support. But we expect this performance to improve in the future with more research and better hardware support. And I'll mention near the end of the talk some more engineering optimizations that we can make. And we looked into after we published this paper to, to improve the numbers a little bit. And so the server per core throughput is pretty good. We can get about 50 megabytes per second for OpenM Health. And we can import about 70 users um, worth of data per minute. Uh, for Puiga, yes. Yes. So the question is, why would you want to use ED448 instead of AES? So AES doesn't allow us to do revocation, um, whereas ED448 does. Okay, so, so that more fits, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah. Uh, the reason is because ED448 uh, is keyhole morphic. And so as a result, with more structure, it's going to be a little bit slower. And would AES ever be um, so the question is, can AES can ever become keyhomorphic? The answer is not in its current state. Um, not it won't be AES. It has to be something different. You can't use AES so because it. Yes. Cool. Awesome. Uh, so I, so the revocation performance is also reasonable. Um, we can re-encrypt the metadata block in 0.63 seconds. We can re-key a 100 kilobyte data block in 0.66 seconds. And we can generate a new 10 attribute key in 0.46 seconds. Um, so I wanted to kind of make some last remarks about CIV and the performance. So first, um, this is not restricted to just Fitbit cloud data. The question is, who are these service uh, storage providers? The storage providers can be Amazon EC2, Google Cloud, Facebook, Twitter, or really any system that has large amounts of user data that can be sh shared. And second, I showed you some performance numbers, but those are for a research prototype to just show its practicality. And the performance can be substantially improved in, I think, two main ways. First, we can build faster ABE libraries that use assembly-based pairing libraries. Um, so my initial benchmarks for this new library called DCLXVI, so that it has a lot of potential. It takes about um, 0.5 milliseconds to do a pairing, um, but I'm not sure how this will translate into the ABE world. Um, and next, we can build um, faster large integer libraries that will make revocation much faster. 
Um, currently, we use um, libgmp, but um, it's not really clear to me what the limiting factors for faster large integer libraries is, and it's definitely worth looking into. And there's, uh, these are just kind of a couple of ways to optimize and improve, um, improve the performance of the system. And it's important that um, we, you know, we work with industry to focus on engineering efforts to reduce um, cryptography bottlenecks. And here are just some, uh, yes. Okay. No, all right. Cool. Um, yeah, just to conclude, uh, I present a, um, a new access control system that allows users to selectively and securely expose your private cloud data to web services. Um, it efficiently uses AB to manage keys and policies. Um, there's a complete revocation scheme that's compatible with hybrid encryption using key homomorphism, and it's easy to integrate and has reasonable performance. And I just wanted to thank a few of my collaborators, James from Harvard, Nikolai and Vinod from MIT, um, who helped me bring me one, one paper closer to graduation. Um, and there's more information uh, about this paper on my website, uh, frankwine.org, and you can follow me on Twitter. So you got another minute and 45 seconds of speaker time and about eight minutes and 20 seconds of uh, audience time. So okay. Uh, so the first question is about, uh, oh, this is your first question is about um, how does the web service know about um, the schema? Um, yeah, so that's one issue we kind of ran into. And the answer to that is we kind of assume that everyone ends up using maybe a standardized schema or the web service tells um, the user, yeah, you should store your data in such a way, or there's some standardized schema that everyone uses. You can imagine people using some form of XML or, or JSON or kind of like working through different types of schema. Um, but yeah, it's something we haven't really looked into is the short answer. Um, so the question is, if there are two services that have the same policy, um, or the same, oh, okay. So the uh, the question is, if two providers should access the same data, if I revoke um, one access, um, will the other one still have access? And the answer is, um, yes. So the way we do it is, after you revoke, you have to send uh, new keys, a, a new key to the the one that had access to the, that you want to access the fitness data. So the, the non-revoked one, you would set in a new key, which is just the same key, but then there's an epic number and you just increment it by one. Yes. Uh, so the question is, um, is if the policy is the same, is the key the same? If um, the answer is yes, if the policy is uh, exactly the same, not include like everything, including the epic number, then you get the same key. But if there's any small variation, it's a different key. So that's why the epic number gives you a new, a different key. Uh, yeah. Um, so the question is, um, I talk about mostly access control for giving selective access. Um, the question is, does uh, do web services know about data blocks they cannot access? So um, hypothetically, they shouldn't unless the storage provider tells them. So the storage provider has kind of a mapping from kind of the different tags to the data. So it maps attributes to the data. And so for example, um, one way the service provider could learn whether it has access to certain data or not is to just like ask for data it's not allowed to access and then try to see if it decrypts it. And I mean, there, the storage provider could offer some form of kind of like filtering in that case. But uh, 
but I, but yeah, it is possible for them to discover what blocks they can't access, but they can't actually access the, the actual data, even though they discover like I don't have access for fitness data, for example. But they can't decrypt the um, the data for that. Yes. So the question is, how confident I am about using this in production? Um, not my research prototype, but I'm I'm pretty confident on. Um, at least pieces of the system actually working. So I've been talking to kind of a variety of people. There's some interest uh, with certain groups actually at Google and at, um, at like ETH Zurich, which are actually interested in kind of like using this into like different production systems or like into their other research projects. Can you, sorry, can you repeat the question? So, so, so you're using some method, like if, if, if you told me, oh, I'm only using AES, then I said, okay, AES is fairly well proven, blah, 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 right? Um, you're using some computing advanced refining in that, and, and other stuff that's needed. Is it all proven secure? Is there stuff you're building on top that's proven secure, or are you confident by a sort of non scientific means that it's pretty good? Okay. Is, oh, yeah. So the question is: Is um, the cryptum schemes I'm using, or the methods I'm using, are they provably secure, or, um, or kind of by, I'm, I, or, 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 you know, if I feel confident about it, I, they are provably secure. So ABE is a provably secure scheme. It's been pretty well studied. It came out in 2006, and people have kind of studied it for the last 10 years in different various different settings. And um, it's based. It's all prov provably secure. Same with kind of this key homomorphic. Um, encryption that we're also using. So the question is, what provably secure public key crypto system am I relying on? So ABE is actually um, a provably secure public key system that, that we're using in the scheme. Yes. Yes. Um, so the um, so the so the question is um, so this isn't used in production right now. Can I use it anytime soon? And the answer is maybe. <laughs> and I, I think the uh, the point is I think parts of it are very interesting um, to to different people. I think it's just a matter of finding the right applications um, for people to use it. I think a lot of interest is actually around. Um, using the re-encryption system, which is pretty convenient because a lot of times like data say, sits on the cloud and it's encrypted and people don't want to decrypt it on the cloud and re-encrypt it in the cloud. So if you use something like Amazon right now, they actually have key rotations. And what they do is that they generate a new key, decrypt the data, re-encrypt it um, kind of like all in the cloud. So if you have kind of a malicious person just hanging out in the cloud, they can kind of see, they wait for you to decrypt the data or the key rotation to happen. I think there's a lot of interest um, from that end. I think like people are interested, for example, there's this new system called Keybase and they're very excited about like doing re-encryption and revocation. It's just the speeds aren't fast enough. And so if we can kind of like think of better key or faster key homomorphic um, schemes, like I think that would help a lot. Um, for getting us closer to closer to production. Yes. Um, so the question is, can you um, replace web services with clients and use the same infrastructure? Um, and, and the answer, the answer is yes. Uh, so web service can be anyone; it could just be another user if you want it to be. Um, yeah, there's no restriction on that. I mean, there's only like a minute left, but if everybody <laughs> was satisfied. 
products, of course. Eh? So thank you very much, Frank. For yeah, thanks. <laughs> for grading the first uh, test timer talk. <laughs>